Okay, we are lagging a little behind the schedule. I think I'll start. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce myself. I am Professor Debayan Bhattacharya. I'm an assistant professor at the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Uh, we have our next session. Uh, next speaker, Dr. Nick Barton. Dr. Nick Barton doesn't uh, require any kind of, uh, any kind of introduction. Uh, he is a renowned expert in the field of rock mechanics, uh, the Q system, which he has introduced for rock mass characterization. So he will be delivering uh, and he will be sharing some thoughts on his talk, Continuum or Discontinuum, GSI or JRC. Uh, questions for a generation. So over to you, Dr. Barton. I would request all of you to uh, invite him with a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for coming back from the nice lunch place. It's tempting to stay there longer, yeah? So, the, the, the end of this title, Questions for a Generation, that sounds a little bit sort of grand, but it's really meaning that I think uh, a younger generation perhaps has been concentrating a bit too much on these continuum modeling, in some countries at least, maybe not in India. So, some of the message is directed to them and to think carefully when they're doing continuum modeling and using things like GSI. GSI is not the Geological Survey of India, incidentally. It's a Hooke's method, yeah? <laughs> Just so that's clear. Because there'll be some critique of GSI and no, no critique of the Geological Survey of India is intended, of course. So uh, this is some of the, the content, some misgivings about the state of the art. I'll jump straight across then to some physical models to save time and uh, some lessons we learn before UDEC and then quite a lot of examples of UDEC BB and uh, 3DEC because I've been kind of passionate for the effect of jointing in rock masses right from more than 50 years ago because I was influenced by some important people in Imperial College, not Hook but some colleagues before Hook. One of them was Peter Kando, actually. He was a student colleague. And we'll look at the BB criterion, some problems with Moore Coulomb, Hook Brown, critique of GSI, deformation moduli estimation. And even though it's tunneling conference, I need to show a little bit about some problems with uh, modeling rock slopes if you're using continuum models. There are some really some serious problems there. So. Let's get straight on. I, I, I won't go through this because we have to save some time, but I've been concerned for some decades that we've moved away from the discontinuum modeling that we, we finally got into when Peter Kandel's codes came along. Yeah, That was a very important step, and we had a wonderful time in NGI for 10, 15 years when I was there after we had this UDEC BB code available on 3DEC. Yeah? So, unfortunately, despite these wonderful books by Hook and Brown, Hook and Bray, um, am I not speaking loud enough? Okay. So, uh, despite these wonderful books by Hook and Brown and Hook and Bray, they, Hook has kind of pushed us towards continuum modeling with GSI and Hook Brown equations, and I'm not sure that that's all positive. JRC, which I developed uh, about 40 years ago, it also has some questions about uh, quantification, <coughs> but it's not involved in these amazingly complex, <coughs> amazingly complex uh, equations that you will see. So I'm going to show UDEC example, 3DEC, FLAC, FLAC 3D, and, and FRACOD. And, uh, but first, a little pre-UDEC phase when we didn't have UDEC. It was just a few years before. and. Uh, in, in the case of my thesis, it was 10 years before, because uh, Kandel had not developed his UDEC for another 10 years, I guess. And then I had a period in NGI when I also did some physical models that you'll see, and, and they were specifically underground oriented. So way back as a student, I developed this machine that could create sort of fractured 2D rock masses. and. Uh, in a very few years, Kandor showed his great intelligence and how he could produce a computer model with much more flexibility. So 
those are some slope studies that one of his PhD students did just after MUDEC, a mu, Greek mu, MUDEC was developed first, yeah. So the guillotine that I developed as a student, it's shown there, and you, you can create a, a set number one and then rotate the slab and reset number two, and you can create uh, DST samples. And in fact, these DST samples, they were the forerunner of JRC JCS criterion. I didn't know that at the time, of course. And then moving 10 years later to period at NGI, I had this, uh, what they used to call an ox grill, because you can rotate it from horizontal to vertical to increase gravity while you load triangularly or trapezoidally in the boundaries, yeah, to give you horizontal stress. So we were studying actually the possibility to put uh, nuclear power plants underground in, in with 50 meter span reactor holes at that time. And also I could kind of model or, or, or look at what the DST tests were telling us of these uh, fractured samples, recreate them, shearing and dilating them exactly as they were measured using plastic replicas. And here I've changed the, the stresses to prototype scale, prototype strength, JCS of 50, uh, JRC about 20. We didn't know GRC at that time, but it was about 20, yeah? And the normal stress simulated about 4.6 MPA, and the black areas, that's kind of overlapped asperities. It's showing where there would be damage and gouge production, yeah? So this was a forerunner, really, of the UDEC, of the GRC-JCS criterion, which we put into UDEC-BB. So those are the central area of six of the large cavern spans before benching down further. And you can see the, the effect of the jointing. The, the jointing and the right scale is exactly shown here. So there's, there's up to many thousands of blocks in these models. And uh, depending upon the jointing and the horizontal stress, you get quite different behavior. The, the actual model material is this bright orange because of red lead to give the density of 2.0. And there's some cabins that were deliberately with narrow pillars. So as you excavate the first, the second, the third, the fourth, you don't get reversal of the deformation vectors in the pillars, which you would in an elastic model, yeah? So there's kind of a hysteresis, which is in interesting. And maybe it's exaggerated, but we have to look out for this in, in rock masses as well. So the practice of rock mechanics can actually be more interesting than looking at GSI and estimating MB and D, the disturbance factor. And we'll see how many times some of these parameters are actually applied when we're using these methods. Obviously, it takes more time to represent the geology with greater reality, as we try to do when we represent discontinua. So You've seen the, the, these diagrams earlier today. I'm not sure from what source, but this is from a paper I wrote in uh, 86. And it's using the N component of, of Bandis's closure tests and the S component for the large scale. And then putting it together in three potential rock masses there with the normal closure, the N, and the S component, dominated by conjugate shear. And the column of basalt loaded from the side, you get a combination of the N and the S components. So actually you get linear, and this has been measured in, in large uh, plate-loaded tests in, in basalts in the USA. And I also studied the effect of block size. So the, the model we see on the left is 4,000 blocks, and I also had 1,000 blocks and 250 blocks with a wider spacing of the fractures. And uh, I got a kind of an inverse type of scale effect there. So the, actually these uh, rather large DST in relation to the block size, the DST gave the lower shear strength and the smallest block sizes actually gave the highest shear strength because there was no clay in these small blocks. If you have a, a model with even more blocks, there's 10,000 blocks here in a UDEC more Coulomb model you can imagine there's no clay either here, but the disturbed zone is getting worse and worse as your block size is reducing. So if you add clay and water, and you imagine the, the problems that fault zones cause us just from 
seeing a model like that. So block size is really important, and where do we, how do we model it in, in continuum models, yeah? So different from GSI, Hook Brown, Phase 2, RS2, to state the obvious, there's no continuum models or GSI-based Hook Brown to match the essentially discontinuous behavior we've just seen in the previous figures. GSI users perhaps can be happy that their rock engineering activities are significantly easier thanks to rock science software. But was the practice of rock mechanics for rock engineering supposed to be easy and, and perhaps even boring? I mean, I think personally I'm biased, but I think the, the modeling that you see now is, is more, interesting, more interesting than continuum models. So some of the input data that you would need for a UDEC BB model is shown on the left diagrams. The joint orientations, the joint statistics, the, maybe the aperture and the permeability in the number three, the JRC JCS FIR statistics for different sets, preferably, and then the shear stress displacement, dilation displacement, permeability displacement, normal closure, and so on. So these are some of the first tunnel models that we did with the UDEC BB and Oslo tunnel. And uh, these are shots of UDEC studies for uh, a spiral access tunnel with TBM that was uh, planned for uh, an underground research lab in Sellafield in northwest England. First through the sandstones, siltstones, and then in the welded tuff, jointed welded tuff. So completely different sort of behavior. and. Uh, I think you learn quite a lot. Maybe it's some exaggeration, but you learn quite a lot from doing these UDEC models. Incidentally, we, we let the geologists draw the geometry and then it's digitized. We don't use these joint generator or have exactly the same jointing right across a model because that teaches very little. You might as well do a continuum model if you do that. And uh, another model, this is actually a tunnel in Japan that was rather unstable very heavy loading of the rock bolts we can see and you can see the performance of the fiber reinforced shotcrete as well so you can learn a lot of things from from this detail of modeling in comparison with with continuum models and although it's only 2d you can actually study drawdown of a water table and uh, inflow so in this model with two joint sets the uh, the steep dipping joints had the lowest shear strength uh, but they had uh, low permeability, and it was actually the sub-horizontal that were involved in the inflow and the drawdown of the groundwater. And 3 deck sometime, this was a, a study in Japan where they would have a pilot to do pre-bolting of a large span that would be drill and blasted. This caused some consternation for me at least, and you can see obviously the need to have a, a 3 deck model for a case like that. So I won't go through this list, but one of the people who's done significant UDEC modeling is in the room. Um, <coughs> so where is his name written there? Third name, yeah, Dr. Marta Gutierrez, a distinguished US professor. He did a lot of very nice modeling in, in UDEC, in NGI, when we had a big team doing such studies for various projects, including offshore subsidence. Um, you can use UDEC for scoping studies with very simplified geometries. So this is one that Tunbridge did, where the, the horizontal stress is increased from isotropic at the top to high horizontal stress in the bottom, and you see the, the big improvement in quality. Yeah? And then you can have the more realistic jointing, again, drawn by engineering geologists, actually me in this particular case, and digitized takes one day to digitize this geometry and, and get the geometry that you want to do the, to do the actual studies. <clears throat> so overbreak, we had a small section on overbreak in the lecture yesterday, so I'll be very brief. You remember this uh, model here that's JN over JR of six or more. It's very difficult to avoid the overbreak, even with careful blasting, actually. <coughs> And we went through this before. You remember the studies that showed that several of the Q parameters could explain the, the position of the, the case of caving, yeah? 
So compare Q-logging of rock masses with up to six parameters with the limitations of GSI. So I'm just going to show you when we're logging with Q, we are only representing six of these rock mass parameters here. So concerning structure, it's RQD over JN. Concerning joint character, it's JR over JA. And concerning the active stress, it's JW and SRF. So all these other parameters we would collect if we were going to do a worthy sort of UDEC BB or, or three deck model. And we collect the parameters with these histograms as, you, as you've seen yesterday. Yeah? And we can do the Q-logging of core. Here, actually, I think each of these shows a five meters of core. As we go down through different core boxes, so we fill in the numbers. We're allowed five opinions of each core box, and we get a statistic because you can't exactly predict. And one particular RQD, there's a variation, JN, maybe some variation also. So doing histograms give you, gives you a possibility to be aware of some doubts, yeah? And uh, here I'm going to go quickly through three slides. We're going down the same borehole. We start in saprolite soil at the top. It's a borehole in sandstone for an application of Q-slope in Panama. And imagine how this contrasts with looking at a GSI diagram just in a moment. So we go from here down the same borehole. We go a bit more to the right and a bit more to the right, going through the same rock type, but with much more sophistication than anything like this. Yeah. So do we really want to think that we're doing rock engineering when we're just moving colored points around like that with the just two parameters, basically? Uh, JRJA, as you've seen yesterday, you saw the top half of this. This is a kind of a more sophisticated system for describing shear strength. This is when there's some clay coatings, some lower friction angles, yeah? <coughs> so maybe if we decide we are going to do discontinuum modeling, as you've been seeing, we need the BB parameters for input. And uh, let's move straight on to this. So we would chose this equation which has the JRC, JCS, and we need scaled values of these, yeah? And uh, this is just the direct shear test that we're done on these something like 35 uh, samples to get the peak shear strength to develop this uh, criterion and find out that phi R was an important correction compared to phi basic that it was in an earlier version of the equation. And uh, we have... Uh, a series of index tests, they're very simple to do. They're interesting to do as a student exercise. So you do these, uh, these uh, index tests, and then you take the sample and you do a direct shear test and compare the prediction with the results. So I think it's a very useful exercise for learning rock mechanics, jointed rock mechanics, yeah? And it has some interest more than just choosing a GSI value, in my opinion. So those Samples on the top left there, they actually happen to be these 10 samples that Shube and I chose to represent the range of samples that we've been testing. Here you see tilt tests of axially jointed core. They're slight different in angles here. So back calculated, these are about uh, JRC of about eight at that scale, and about 13 at a smaller scale, 10 centimeter scale. So tilt tests is actually a three-dimensional test. It's not looking at profiles. It's much more reliable than, than doing looking at profiles for choosing JRC. Uh, this scheme, it gives you a rough idea of, of where, where one ha may have the most appropriate uh, modeling choice. So UDEC BB, UDEC and 3DEC MC, maybe they stretch over a range Q of 0.1 to a couple of hundred. And maybe this is the, the most frequent range. Maybe 90% of rock masses in the world are in that range. I'm not sure. It depends. It goes from country to country, of course. <coughs> Extremely to the left, you have no option but to do fine element or flak. Extremely to the right, maybe boundary element or, or fine element or fracod. Um, when we look at these two identical motorway geometries, feeding tunnel as well, feeder tunnel on the right. Um, one is FLAC, a wonderful code developed also by Peter Kandel, and the other is UDEC, UDEC-BB in this case. 
So which, which model do we learn most from by, by studying the, the deformation vectors, the anisotropy, the problems in the pillars, etc.? The day is much more interesting if you can do these UDEC models, these discontinuum models, because rock masses are mostly discontinuous. <coughs> if we have to do continuum, then we need these yield functions, elastic brittle, elastic plastic. We get a very poor match to the observed breakouts with line drilling in this famous URL underground research lab from Canada. Uh, this PhD study in Canada, actually, the, the, the student, an Iranian student, he found that he got a, a much better match to the overstress zone by degrading cohesion and mobilizing friction. And, and we've done that also. An Indian colleague did that in some, some mine studies, some stoping studies some years ago. Pandey was his name. Uh, Fracod is a very nice code. So here Fracod has been applied to this very earliest TBM tunnel from 1880, the Beaumont Tunnel, next to the Channel Tunnel. And with the assumption of just a single set of, of bedding planes, this is how the fracturing develops, extension fracturing moving into shear fracturing. In this overstressed borehole studies, we always got uh, in, in, interlo interlocked uh, conjugate shearing, <coughs> log spiral shearing, yeah, where there was actual shearing on these surfaces. And the, the, the model on the right is, is Fracord, 1,000 meter depth simulated with or without jointing. This is what this first tunnel looked like in, in, in a few hundred meters length. We go from a wedge failure to stress failure because it's turned under a cliff 70 meter high. It's a very weak rock. And then it's under the sea and the cyclic loading from the, from the tidal effect. So that it's actually a TBM. All three are a TBM tunnel, if you can believe, originally. Yeah? <coughs> OK, we move on to a quick critique of GSI, Hook Brown. So th there are these amazing equations for C and phi and the, sub and the sort of supportive equations, the, the three more there. And then these equations for modulus. And modulus, you need an estimate of the disturbance factor. And as you can see from this curve here that somebody else produced, you can virtually get any deformation modulus you want. So I don't know how people are, are using this method for, for doing numerical modeling because it's so dependent upon which d, va d value you use. And amazingly, these two equations, I don't know how many users know this. I didn't know it until I looked carefully. If you use these, the basic, uh, the, the supportive equations in the dark colors and the, the light green, you find that GSI actually appears 16 times in the equation for phi, for C, and it appears 12 times in the equation for phi. So if you make a small mistake, you can imagine what effect that has on the analysis you're trying to do. And this is a simpler method of estimating modulus if you don't have to correct for depth. E equals 10 Q sub C to the power one third. And if you have to correct for depth, then both the velocity and the, and the modulus, they change with depth. And this is a screen, a screen I published, uh, a method I published in 1995 that not many people seem to have seen, but it's, it's a way to estimate modulus if you need to correct for depth or stress level. For some reason, GSI apparently needs to be improved, the, the quantification. So this is one of the more creative suggestions for improving the quantification of GSI. There's a series of equations in the literature that others have collected. And again, a published method that thousands of people are using, why it needs improving, why are so many people using it if they have such confidence in it, I don't understand. So some few examples of rock slopes, and then we're finished. Uh, reality, how we'd put that in a continuum, I'm not sure. Uh, the, the famous diagrams from Hook and Bray, these here, these are from my thesis. At one stage, I was very convinced, and I'm still convinced, uh, you, you can have, of course, very severe weathering. In this case, it was an open pit in slates in Rio Tinto in Spain. And the whole slope, all the slopes were kind of just subsiding, and, and it was a circular type of failure. But 
in general, you're going to have the influence of jointing on failure. So I don't believe in a study like that. This is a flax 3D slice using the, the best aspects of Hook Brown and Moore Coulomb, according to the authors. And I don't believe we get failures like that in, in slopes unless it's soil or clay or rock fill. Jointed rock with faults, it's not going to fail like that. It's not going to fail like this. The, the, the statement there, this is a section of a rock mass, of a rock slope in a rock, excuse me. This is a section of a rock slope in a rock mass that obeys the Moore Coulomb or Hook Brown failure criterion. That may be a very true statement, but does any rock follow those criteria is a question. They don't fail like with those curved surfaces, unless they're extremely weak like saprolite or soil or, or rock fill. Again, we, we don't see this in rock mechanics. We don't see these beautiful, this is a wonderful set of results, but is it realistic actually of, of the way that rock fails? I don't think so. This is supposedly a circular failure, but actually it's a very big wedge failure if you lead, read into the literature. And uh, the observations of failures in open pits, there are very, very few cases where some structure or faulting is not mentioned. Just the blue ones don't have a mention of structure, if we forget tension cracks, yeah? All the others are talking about jointing affecting the, the failure mode. This is maybe really circular. We're not sure underneath, but it looks like a spoon-shaped failure yeah? in, in, in completely weathered material. And this one here, this one, is also not a circular failure. There are, there are various reasons for this failure. One of them is that it's uh, got a, a plain fault surface there. And uh, it's also a, a sort of nose that has been excavated at the top there. You can see that the benches, they went round in a circle here, yeah? So there were several reasons for that failing, and it's not circular failure. Just go back to this. This is a way of picking up the possibility of, of progressive failure. So you, <coughs> you break the cohesion with intact bridges, you mobilize the new fractures. That's a crack sound, this is a crunch sound. You scrape on the joints that may be involved and you swish if there's a fault zone with a clay, for example. So CCSF is a criterion that I've kind of proposed. So now to the conclusions. Discontinuum modeling allows real behavior to be more closely simulated than with continuum models. And the addition of C and phi components of shear strength in more Coulomb and Hook Brown is seldom valid. So degradation of C and mobilization of phi seems to work better, yeah? The past two decades use of GSI and Hook Brown equations to represent shear strength of rock masses has appeared useful to users, that's for sure. Some have been given pay rises because the pictures they show they develop so quickly, they look really nice, yeah? But is it true? Is it true stuff? It's been proved in a court case that, that uh, plastic zones are, are grossly exaggerated, for example. So it's seen to be full of problems for those familiar with jointed and faulted rock behavior. Although large-scale continuum modeling for sure is needed to define local-scale boundary conditions, the presence of joint sets and faults will not allow circular failure to be a valid mechanism for slope failure unless the rock is very weak. So we need to do big scale continuum model, but then go into detail and see what might be the real behavior. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barton. That was a really insightful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, that's, no, thank you. So now we have our next speaker uh, for this session. Uh, it's Dr. Robert Geller. Uh, professor Robert Geller currently is serving as a full professor of subsurface engineering at Mountain University uh, Le Bon. Please pardon me if I'm uh, pronouncing it wrong. Uh, Austria and head of the department and brings a decade of invaluable experience as project manager in design and construction of underground structures for geoconsultant. Uh, Salzburg in Austria. It's a very nice country, by the way. Uh, beautiful one. His notable contributions to prestigious projects, including the new high-speed rail link between Cologne and Frankfurt in Germany, the tender design for the Semmering Base Tunnel in Austria, and the preliminary design for the Brenner Base Tunnel showcases his expertise. 
Professor Geller's uh, significant roles extend beyond projects, and he has been an integral part of the management board of OGG, Austrian Society for Geomechanics, served as the Austrian representative of the ITA International Tunneling Association since 2005. Taking on a leadership role, he has been the chairman of ITA CET since 2013. Uh, now, it is our pleasure to extend a warm welcome to Professor Robert Geller as he joins us on stage, offering a wealth of knowledge and expertise for our exploration. So please, a uh, warm round of applause for him. Thank you. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a big honor for me to be here. Thanks for the invitation uh, to come to India again. Uh, and uh, yeah, today I would like to uh, give you an overview of NATM. Sometimes I have the feelings uh, that uh, some people think that NATM is just a design, but it is not. It was never. I mean, NATM is 60 years old, and it is, an, uh, it is a full picture from the design to the construction. And I would like to draw uh, your attention uh, on the different points which are really essential in this uh, regard. I will not stick very much to rock mechanics, uh, because I think we had perfect lectures. Uh, Mr. Haas, uh, Nick Barton, Florian Gren, and others uh, are already talking about uh, design issues uh, on rock mechanics and, and so on. I will just strive it a little bit. Now, uh, we have to take care the design uh, of tunnels has to consider a lifetime. And the lifetime at minimum is 100 years because we have such a huge investment so the, that we have to take care that the design takes really care on the life cycle uh, of these 100 years. And this then, all of that was, has to be inside the tunnel, has to be considered, of course, by breaking out the tunnel. And uh, I just wanted to give you a, a, a small figure. What are the aspects which we have to uh, take care on? First, of course, safety. I mean, in, in earlier times, safety wasn't a big issue, but uh, since we had the big tunnel fires in Europe in the year 2000, more or less, Switzerland, Austria, Italy, we had the big fires. Uh, the ideas completely changed, um, and it was now, or it is now, safety first. Then, of course, we have to do uh, the aerodynamic studies because the aerodynamic uh, heavily influences the design of the uh, underground structure. And then we come to alignment. Uh, alignment studies, we, uh, I, I don't know if you know, but Europe has the goal to save energy. So we are not allowed to make an alignment which is steeper than 8 per mil. And we are not allowed to make an alignment which doesn't allow to go with 250 kilometers per hour. So this gives us a minimum radius, and this gives us um, a, a maximum uh, inclination of the projects to save energy. And that's why we have sometimes alignments which are uh, getting quite long. Uh, vibrations is a topic. Uh, population does not accept any vibrations due to uh, traffic, rail, or metro, or some, something else. So uh, it's a big uh, no-go. So vibrations design, and then equipment design. Equipment design completely changed, and the cost on the, uh, on the Gotthard-based tunnel was majorly influenced by the cost of the uh, equipment, not by the geology changes, but the, the equipment changed so, uh, so much. And these caused a lot of uh, more cost because they didn't consider at the beginning. So we learned from this, please uh, uh, invest a lot of uh, thoughts into what will be the equipment, because this will influence your design a lot. And then, of course, geology. I mean, we heard of, uh, about this uh, a lot already. Hydrogeology, method of construction, and many more. And this is uh, what we have to take care of. So if you are the design coordinator, then uh, there are some gray fields which have to uh, be taken into account, but safety first. Safety will uh, influence your design the most, because you need escape ways, you need shafts, whatever you need. Uh, safety drives your design. And then, of course, is the cost, uh, because it will only be realized uh, if uh, the cost is not too high. And in between, there's the geotechnical design. But you see there are a lot of fields to be, uh, to be taken into account. I just wanted to bring you some uh, pictures from safety. What do I mean by that? We, we have a research center uh, opened in 2021, uh, meanwhile, which is an um, underground structure which has four kilometers of real underground structures. So full-scale railway tunnels, full-scale motorway tunnels, and tunnels which are in, say, operation. And what we do here is we do safety trainings for the construction of the tunnel on a regular basis, which has a direct influence in the tender, because safety uh, is, is uh, to be considered during construction. 
Um, and these trainings give an output, and we do that with the site managers, we do that even with the students. So uh, everybody has to be clear what happens if an accident happens. Next point is safety during the operation. The operation is another, is another point. Uh, so uh, we have to train all the rescue teams, the police, the rescue teams, the fire brigades, all of them on safety issues because this has an influence on the design of your underground structure and we get the most uh, infos from the police, from the uh, rescue teams, okay, this and this should be done in another way. Meanwhile, we are also training uh, all of that, uh, incorporating the population. What did you know, what did you not know uh, of these underground structures so that, that you can safely uh, rescue maybe yourself? So, uh, in regard to hydrogeology, of course, we, we, we are now in a period where we are not allowed to level down the groundwater anymore. So uh, what we have to do is uh, we have to do injections. Uh, the, the situation of building drained tunnel is more or less over. Uh, because the environmental guys do not allow. The environmental guys tell us, okay, water is a really high valuable uh, good. And so uh, leveling down the groundwater is a no-go. And we did that uh, in earlier times. And by doing that and looking into the uh, pipes where we level down the groundwater, we see that we have sinter. And if you don't uh, clean these uh, uh, pipes, you will get stuck because your water table will raise up and then damage your uh, concrete structures. So hydrogeology is a big uh, point because maintenance uh, has to be considered in the lifetime of your tunnel. If you, if you don't clean these pipes on a regular basis, you will have a blocked uh, drainage pipe. And this causes a water pressure on your shells. You know? uh, so this goes directly into your uh, life cycle cost. And uh, this means if you have to clean these pipes be it be behind your uh, inner lining, then you have to close your tunnel. A railway tunnel has to be closed. Major problem at uh, Gotthard Base Tunnel nowadays. They have two tubes, 57 kilometers long, and one of them most time closed because cleaning, maintenance. And this, uh, now they are thinking on a third tube. Uh, a third tube of 57 kilometers is now under, let's say, preparation. So maintenance cost is a, is a, a, a real driver of a, a project. Let's say we open the project here. Up to here, you had cost for the construction of the, uh, of the tunnel. But then what we didn't tell the clients in many cases is, uh, dear client, you have to take care. Your cost is raising up because energy cost, maintenance cost. And if we did a design which didn't take into account the maintenance too much, this will quite, uh, be quite steep. And please, dear client, consider you have high cost at the beginning, of course, for the construction. But uh, then after commissioning, uh, a certain time after, you will have cost, majorly cost of maintenance. Our experience is that the major cost of, uh, for the maintenance, first repair works, occur after about 20 years. And then uh, you have another period where you have to do a renewal if your design uh, didn't uh, take into account all, those, all of this uh, maintenance. Uh, and, and as I said, if we do it watertight, fully tanked, for example, we save a lot of maintenance costs with the design at the beginning. So the design has a major influence on the steepness of this uh, operation cost. New design, so to say, looks like this, no pipes anymore, uh, double lining. Uh, we are not sure if we will uh, follow the double lining uh, in future because we are working on a single lining solution. Uh, but for the moment, we have mo in most projects a double lining solution. Another, uh, another really important point, a few uh, which has to be done in a, in a European project is you have to make a plan where you s uh, tell the client which material broken out from the tunnel can be reused in which way. The, the point is, in Europe, we are losing space for landfill, for deposit. I don't know how the situation here in India is, but we are now thinking on uh, reusing all this uh, material like a mine does. A mine is uh, taking out some material, then making a product out of it. So we are arguing for a, a, a manager for material sitting on every construction site so that he is uh, bringing this material to the right path for uh, reusing. 
But uh, this plan has to consider also uh, depositing classes in case you, uh, you bring in, let's say, too much uh, materials for, from the blasting, nitrogen or so, so that you cannot reuse it at the end, then depositing classes uh, should be mentioned on the plan. So this is a must uh, for the authorities. You have to show where to reuse, how to reuse, and if you cannot reuse, okay, where would you then uh, bring it? This is a little bit of change in the mind, because in the earlier days we just uh, deposited anywhere. Um, sustainable uh, development goals, you might know that uh, the UN has given uh, sustainable development goals. We are now uh, coming into a period where, we, where tunneling has to be a sustainable process. And the question from the EU which was asked to us is, okay, where is tunneling considering our sustainable uh, development goals? And we found out uh, we, we can stick to uh, number nine, industry, innovation, uh, and infrastructure, sustainable uh, cities and communities, responsible consumption, the point which I mentioned before, uh, then immense saving in CO2, because CO2 is the driver in, in Europe at least, um, and uh, then we have this landfill space which we should uh, not take uh, too much into account because we are running out of, uh, of space where we are allowed to bring such materials to. Um, of course, lower CO2 emissions due to reduced transport routes. If we really bring that to a product immediately, we reduce uh, CO2 emissions, and we would like to re uh, we would like to save reserves, mineral resources for the future generation. And this we can do by uh, by following these development goals. Of course, this uh, means. Um, Increased technical and logistical efforts on site, material characterization has to be done on site. So, we need colleagues who can follow online technologies on site directly, uh, processing, and so on. So, these were some, some points which should be considered in the early stage design before we start geomechanical design, because now we have all the points which have to be considered, uh, and now we have this uh, geomechanical design. Uh, Florian was already talking about uh, geomechanical design. Uh, first of all, ground mass types have to be considered. Uh, mountain water, primary stress, orientation, uh, discontinuities uh, in the tunnel. We are doing then the calculations out of that. But, as uh, Florian mentioned already, without any support and full cross-section, not considering any construction steps, this is the meaning of behavior type. This was... Uh, fixed in the guideline 2002 uh, that we do just a paperwork because we will not see that any time on a real construction site because you will not full break it out and then make no support in it. What we like to uh, what we try to learn out of that is how will this tunnel fail? This is what we would like to see on a paperwork. Uh, and we call that behavior type. And we have, in the Austrian did, uh, deduction, 11 behavior types. This, this is what it is. We fixed that in 2002. And then we have assessment uh, of boundary conditions and requirements. What does it mean if I uh, underpass, for example, this university with, uh, let's say, three meters uh, overburden, then my requirements will be a little bit different than I make a tunnel in the Himalayas. Uh, the requirements um, and the boundary conditions are completely uh, different. And based on that, I select then my construction concept and uh, I sort out my excavation and support type and we call that the system behavior. This, of course, then has to be calculated. Um, just another um, a picture of such a behavior type. You see, we make a full cross-section. Uh, we, we look into the geological um, sketch, so to say, what will happen if I do nothing. This is a first way to understand what will happen if I do nothing. And this drives me then to, to make construction sequences, top heading bench inward, for example, sidewall galleries, whatever, um, to, to find the right methods to keep that uh, stable. I don't want to go through these uh, 11 behavior types because we saw it already today by Florian's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, it starts with one stable, uh, goes over the six uh, up to the number 11, ground with uh, frequently changing deformation characteristics. If somebody is interested in that, 
on the website of the Austrian Society of Geomechanics. You can download this guideline for free, so uh, everything is explained uh, very much in detail there. Uh, we have to say we have a new guideline from 2023, but it's only available for the moment in German. We are now translating it because it came up with the last uh, ISM con Congress in October 2023. It was published. This is available in German, also on the same homepage. Uh, and as I said, we are working on the English version. Now, how does it uh, go ahead uh, when we have sorted out? We are still in the design phase. When we have sorted out the excavation and support based on the prognosis of the geology, uh, we then um, try to find an equilibrium where we say, okay, the system behavior, system means support, excavation, uh, sequence, and surrounding rock. This uh, system behavior conforms the requirements. If this is yes, we can go ahead. If this is no in the calculation, we have a loop. We do that as long as we comply now with the requirements. And then we can make a geotechnical baseline report of, uh, out of it where we have these excavation and support requirements written down on a plan. And this plan is, in, is installed in all the construction uh, offices uh, where we are. We start with this design drawing. Um, of course, this leads us then to some text because we have to make a contract out of that. Uh, and this contract leads then to our tender documents. Now the design, so to say, is closed. But please be clear, we are working on a prognosis. Um, I'm coming from, let's say, the Brenner Base Tunnel. We have 1,800 meter overboard. Nobody was there. Neither we nor the geologist. So we have to be clear that this is a prognosis and is a nice drawing and is based on fine calculations, uh, either UDEC or Plaxis or, 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 or whatever calculation it is, and we heard a lot of formulations today, but we have to be clear that all of that what is shown on this drawing is based on a prognosis. This is really essential. And that is why I would like to bring you a little bit into now the contractual means um, of the NATM. This is a long section of a 60 kilometer long tunnel, which is the Brenner Base Tunnel. On the right side, we have Italy. On the uh, uh, east side, we have uh, Austria. And of course, here we have an overburden of 1,800 meters. We have here some, some rocks which are better known, but in this area here, we know nothing because we have some drill cores going down, okay, but it's only a needle. So in reality, we know a little bit of that. We can make nice calculations based on that. But in reality, you see how complex the system is. This is just the Austrian side of this tunnel. So we have all at all just uh, out of here. We have 60 kilometers plus the about five kilometers in direction of Munich. So this tunnel gets a length of about 65 kilometers is quite complex in 3D, so the stresses are running down a little bit complex because we have several tubes over uh, the other. So how can you do that with analytical formulations and even with numerics? Um, please be clear, you only or we only have a prognosis in hands. What the geologist tells us, and we as a geotechnical engineer try to make the best out of it, but we are clear that this is a very, very complex situation from the stress point of view. So uh, just, just to, to, to relate on one picture which Schubert once did, uh, he, he just uh, compared the homogeneous uh, continuums model uh, with some, uh, let's say, schistosities, uh, discontinuities, and you see the same stress situation, uh, but uh, the outcome for where to set boards and where it doesn't matter, uh, or where it doesn't make sense to set boards is completely different. If, you, if one designer does the left-hand side calculation, he comes to a complete other solution in the uh, design for the tender than the other designer who, who uses a maybe more realistic model. But the question is, what is more realistic? Nobody was there before. Yeah? So we are the first then coming when we are constructing this tunnel. So NATM uh, already included the thought, okay, how can we make a contract which then allows to make modifications following the real geotechnical conditions which we meet. 
And these uh, ideas are now incorporated in the so-called Emerald Book. In 2019, FIDIC was uh, publishing uh, the, the Emerald Book, and this completely incorporates all these ideas from the NATM uh, which we had. It's a more Swiss and Austrian um, uh, code which, which uh, was uh, going into this uh, Emerald Book. So, uh, we are setting up this contract, uh, of course, based on a prognosis. We, we, we do not have anything else. So what does it mean? What, uh, now the question is, we would like to be very fair to the construction company. Uh, and in our rule, and also the FIDIC rule says, the uh, risk of the geology is on the side of the client. Is on the side of the client. This is a really uh, important point. And the classification now consists of two major factors. The one is ground properties and ground behavior. You already heard what is ground behavior. It's not considering any, uh, let's say, uh, support methods. And then the amount and type of support measures on the advance rate. I will show you immediately what I mean with that. The excavation and support classes are, new, uh, are now defined in two characteristic values. The one is the round length. How far can I open in one set let's say, my, my, my underground structure. This is round length. And the other is the support factor, meaning how much support do I have to bring in on this open round length? And we have a small equation for that, which says this is the support quantity. Support quantity means, OK, short grid, bolts, arches, wire mesh, uh, whatever you, you put in, multiplied by a rating factor. The rating factor is given in the standard. The rating factor takes into account how complicated is it to bring in this certain uh, support. So is it more complicated to bring in a short grid or is it uh, more complicated to bring one meter of board, bring in one meter of board? And I tell you, we, we have thousands of measurements by students who were just watching, okay, the construction company here and here and here and there and finding out how long does it take to install a SN board. How long does it take to make an EBO board? How long does it take to bring up short grid? 15 centimeter, 20 centimeter, 30 centimeter. How long does it take? How long does it take to set up a, an arch? And, and, and. And by having all these measurements, by stopping uh, just a nice, uh, let's say, job for the students, but f uh, for us, uh, really uh, valuable, because now we know on very uh, much uh, construction sites how long does it take. And this is the rating factor. And this we divide by the rating area. What is the rating area? It is uh, completely different if I have to bring in my support in a four meter diameter tunnel or a 10 meter diameter tunnel. Because if I have a 10 meter diameter tunnel, I can use completely other machines. Then uh, if I have to do the same in a very small tunnel. That's why we consider the rating area and this equation sums up all the material. Again, we are in the design. Yeah? We, we, we know not more than the design and we are now calculating this support factor. What do we do with that? We are still relying on the prognosis. We are saying, okay, what is our round length? And we make a subdivision in possible round lengths, what we can imagine on the specific project. And we have the support factor, which we were speaking of. How much support do we bring in? And then we, for example, sort it out in this special case, okay, we allow a round length up to 1.3 meter in this specific case, and we calculated the uh, support factor, which considers all the support which we have, divided by the rating area, and this gives us one single number. And for this single number, we ask the construction company, tell us, what is the cost for that? Here's the design drawing you know how much support we bring in, what is the cost for that, and how many meters can you do if you build exactly this design. So, um, this gives us an exact number of dollars per meter of tunnel, and as we don't want to discuss if he brings in one board more, or two boards more, or one board less, a little bit less short grid, we said we agree on a bandwidth, this is given in the standard, we agree on a bandwidth, within this bandwidth, the cost stays um, stable. No change of the cost if it's a little bit changing, you know. 
and um, the velocity which he promised uh, also stays stable. So in this box, we have fixed the construction company, this is the cost we pay, and this is the, the velocity you have to drive. We don't care if he drives really, but he has to. He, he pays a penalty if he cannot, and he, he has a win if he is faster. Now, this gives us a matrix at the end. All the design drawings get such a box, and at the end he gets these boxes. And for these boxes, he has to give us all the prices for each box and all the velocities. So now, based on the design, we are still on a prognosis, uh, I can uh, accurately calculate how long he will take for this construction. Now we are coming to the construction. In the construction, of course, I have to find out what are my ground types, what did I uh, have in the prognosis, and what is re reality. It could be quite different, of course. Uh, then I have to uh, identify if my determination of my excavation and support was right or was wrong. I mean wrong. The geology maybe is not the one which the prognosis said. So it could change so that I need another excavation and support because my monitoring results, and this is essential, I have to verify my system behavior by, by objective monitoring. Uh, and these monitoring results now tell me, okay, my utilization in my, in my shot grid shell is too high. I have to ex enlarge a little bit the shot grid thickness. I have too little boards, too, uh, the number of boards is too little, or it's too high. Uh, both uh, directions. So it can happen that my system behavior complies with the system behavior which was based on the prognosis or is different. If it is different, the question is, okay, is the geology not that one which was in the prognosis, which is the most time the case because the geologists also cannot uh, see what, what is there. So we have to um, go on either the unfavorable side, meaning we increase the support, or we are on the favorable side, meaning we reduce the support, of course, uh, in those two ways. If it fits completely to the design, so the prognosis was exactly that one which we now meet on site, uh, uh, everything is okay. This brings me to one point. The one who does the geological prognosis must not be the one who sees the real geology. Because if you have the same person working on the prognosis and then on the construction site, he always sees what he had in the prognosis. And we have a law in Austria which forbids that these persons are the same. Because we, we turn out in troubles because he always uh, fights for his prognosis, you know? We would like to see the real geology, not the, what, what was in the prognosis. Now, what, uh, uh, what do we monitor? Normally, we monitor 3D displacement targets. We monitor with the extensometers. We monitor by strain meters, by pressure cells. We monitor by measuring boards. So this is the typical monitoring which we do so that we can really find out what is now really the uh, utilization of my, uh, of my material. Uh, typically, uh, results, um, you see, uh, here we have these vectors, one point is one measurement, and uh, these are typically measurements from, uh, from real construction sites, longitudinal de deformation, convergence or, the, or divergence uh, measurements. Then we measure what is happening on the surface so that we can clearly find out, okay, where is the tunnel uh, actually, how, are the, how is the surface influenced, uh, we measure the shot grid utilization degree. If it's getting red, we are, we are coming to the conclusion, okay, we should uh, increase a little bit the thickness of the shot grid. Uh, if it's blue, we are too, uh, we, we could reduce a little bit because as it seems, the utilization is very low. Um, and then we monitor the face uh, so that we see if the face is coming in. So we do a face mapping uh, without any reflectors, of course. Uh, this is typically what we, what we are doing. Uh, the question is, why should we do so much monitoring? We were asked by the Norwegians, for example, ah, it's so expensive, why we should, should we do that? I mean, uh, geological model has its limits because uh, nobody can look into the earth uh, before you are here. So there are limits in accuracy. Then we have a, lock, uh, a lack of rock and rock mass parameters. Even if we have the best model, what we heard before, 
there will be a lack of, uh, of material parameters because we have just needles which we get out. Uh, so uh, what should we do? How complex the formulations are, uh, it will never be the, uh, meet the reality. Then one essential point which we never discussed about, we had one uh, PhD thesis on this uh, topic, the knowledge of the in situ stress. Who says that the in situ stress is standing perpendicular and horizontal? Who says it could be inclined? And if you have an inclined in situ stress, your situation of the results is completely different. So as long as we are not able to measure the in situ stress very accurately, all the calculations are only, I say always, 50 saying 50% of the truth. Because if the in situ stress, which is a major point where we are building the tunnel in, is missing, and we, uh, we, we accept that this is standing per, uh, vertically and horizontal, I mean, in many cases, because of tectonic stresses, this will not be the case. Yeah? So we have uncertainties and simplifications in the mathematical models. We saw already mathematical models today, but still we have simplifications in there. These are mathematical models. These are thoughts what we have. We cannot do the whole complexity of the nature in a mathematical model. It's impossible. We would like to uh, verify the applied rock classification, of course. The monitoring helps us to control the tunnel stability and to optimize the support and also to optimize the construction sequence. That's it, what we do with uh, monitoring. And then we need to, to train the geotechnical engineer because the geotechnical engineer should uh, realize, okay, here's the normal behavior, this is the normal behavior, but we are deviating from that. And now the uh, question immediately has to come, why are we deviating? And uh, the point is he shouldn't immediately run to this uh, site manager or to the engineer when he has a deviation of, say, 1%, 2%, 3%, because nobody will uh, tell him what to do. So he should really have a feeling in his stomach when to go to the engineer, when to go to the site uh, engineer, because now it's getting dangerous. This is a good qualified uh, geotechnical engineer. Uh, he shouldn't come too late, because if he reacts here, I always like to compare this with a medical doctor. If you get your medicine today, you will not be healthy tomorrow. It will take a time. Yeah? And the rock is our patient. So we give the rock some boards, we give the rock some short grid. Now, the, the, the rock will not be healthy tomorrow. It will take some time to come back to the equilibrium. And this is what I wanted to show with this uh, figure here. It's not we put in the boards and tomorrow everything is good. It's not the case. So to react uh, on a proper time is, is really essential. If he reacts later, it could be too late. Because our experience is, the situation can be very critical. The construction company will not react faster. Because the, uh, and sometimes also the engineer will not react faster because all of them are looking in the contract. Okay, what could be an advantage for myself? To get out of the contract could be an advantage for the site, uh, for the construction company in many cases. Because, of course, a collapse is not in the contract. A collapse uh, could bring some money, truly spoken. Uh, so uh, don't, um, don't think that the construction company rushes uh, because you are running and saying, okay, it's getting serious. It's not the case. It takes the same period if uh, you do it later or earlier. So it's the geotechnical engineer who has to really take care on this. And then comparing the uh, mathematical uh, results have to take care on the fact that we have pre-deformations. If here is the face, you all are familiar maybe with the longitudinal uh, deformation profile. You know that there are pre-deformations in front of the face, but sometimes the colleagues compare the monitoring results with the calculated results, not taking into account that we have pre-deformations. So you have to find out what are your pre-deformations. Gotthard Base Tunnel did 80 uh, meter long extensometers into the face to know what is the pre-deformation. We do uh, pipe roofs uh, ahead, 50 meters, to learn what is the pre-deformation. Because otherwise you don't know what, how much pre-deformation did you already uh, get before you opened the face. And then it's essential the surveyor is not running into because you open your face. The surveyor maybe has his breakfast and then he is coming. But you opened your face maybe at three in the morning. So you lost four hours of deformation. This is essential.
This is really essential. That's why we put all the data in a database. We really uh, write in a database, when was the surveyor here? When did you open the face? We have a minutes uh, diagram where we show which procedure was done in which minute. And nowadays you have an a, um, a app uh, at the face, and you put in, okay, we opened the face today at 3.15, and the surveyor came 7. You lost four hours of deformation. The rock did not wait and say, okay, the surveyor is at breakfast. We wait with the deformation. Uh, it's not the case. So it's really essential. And then to take care on, I just uh, have one hotspot for the uh, mounting of the uh, targets. This has to be done in a proper way. Otherwise, you, if you short grid this point, then you will not see the right deformations. Uh, another point, um, support elements are selected and installed not only by design, but observation. And uh, my question is, what can be changed on site? Yeah, everything can be changed. Increase or decrease your support following the monitoring results. Thickness of short grid, length of boards, number of boards, uh, spacing, number length of spiles, application of short grid at the tunnel face, for example, porting the face, variation of the ring closure time, variation in distance from the face. So there are all things which have to be varied following the real geotechnical conditions which you, uh, which you meet. And this then goes into this, uh, this diagram again, because now you have real conditions, real geological, hydrogeological, geotechnical conditions, and now you fill in your new number, the real uh, number of bolts, the real thickness of short grid, everything real. And as you uh, have a box with prices, you can immediately say, okay, now we shifted, the real geology was different, now we have a new price because we have a new support factor. Yeah? Everything very clear. The, the positive point is on this matter, we have absolutely no claims because velocity is given by the construction company following the boxes. Uh, the cost is given by the construction company at the beginning. If we change based on, uh, on uh, wrong prognosis, we can easily... Uh, follow up. So I have to hurry up a little bit. Um, I would like to come uh, to time dependent cost. Maybe we, uh, I skip that. Time dependent cost means uh, we are paying the construction company for a certain time. And uh, what my example is saying is uh, we have an excavation class one, two, and three. And in the prognosis, we said we have 100, 100, 100 meters on each of them. Uh, and uh, the bidder, the construction company, said, I, for this class I make 10 meters a day, in this class I make 5 meters a day, in this class 1 meters a day. I can immediately calculate, okay, thanks for the velocities. Then, if we have 100 meters in the prognosis, we can say, okay, for this we need 10 days, 100 divided by 5, 20 days with this, uh, 100 divided by 1, we, 100 days gives all at all 130 days. So, the real geology was different and required a uh, support class number one for 140 meters instead of 100, uh, support class number two for 80 meters instead of 100, uh, support class three, uh, 80 meters for 100. All in all, hopefully the tunnel has the same length, uh, of course. Um, so I take the velocities which he told me at the very beginning in the tender stage, and I can immediately say how, how long this construction may, uh, may last. And I do the same calculation, 140 divided by 10, etc. I sum it up, and this gives 110 days. And this is the deadline for the construction company. I will not pay the construction company after these days, even if it takes longer. He promised velocities uh, based on the design, everything, and we stop paying after this date. Of course, if it turns out that uh, we have uh, much, uh, let's say, worse geology, it can go vice versa. It can go on the other way, so that here I get 150 days, so I pay him for 150 days. This was the major uh, idea of NATM also in the beginning. Another very in, uh, interesting and important point is we have, for the moment, 13 different kinds of boards. And these different kinds of boards are set, and I just brought one example, uh, is an injection board, uh, simultaneous drilling, installing, injection, and then tangenting. And my question is, when we look to some construction sites, are the miners properly trained? 
are the miners educated? Sometimes I have a feeling we are, have brilliant engineers, but we, we hand over this work to completely untrained people. How crazy is this? It's like if you go in a medical uh, hospital and then the doctor which comes to you, which is the worker, has no idea of how it works. But the, uh, but the boss knows how it goes, but the boss is not there. So what we see really often is the, mima, the miners have no idea of how it has to be done. So we have to train the miners because the engineers are well trained. This is my, uh, let's say, uh, experience. We have highly um, automized um, machines on construction sites. And we leave it to people who have no training on that. It's a little bit crazy in my mind um, because this needs training. Uh, and my question is, are the miners properly trained again? The course in the clearance profile in drill and blast could be significantly improved and thus reduce the acquire, uh, required amount of shot bit if we train the miners who are doing this job. The other example is also the shot grid. We are relying on the material shot grid. We, we, ha we as engineers think that these guys who are applying the shot grid know how to do it. I tell you, we have three times the same receipt on a construction site. We did tests, uh, three lots, but always the same receipt. We did tests on the shot grid. It was completely varying. Uh, I don't know what the one group did and what the other did. And this is essential. So they apply a material on which we rely in our calculations 100%. We trust that the miners are able to put this material in a high quality on the wall, but it is not done. And this, again, brings me to the question, are the miners really properly trained? Sometimes we see people there who have no idea how this material is working, how this material is mixed, how it is sprayed. It is a completely different if I have this distance for, uh, with my shot grid nozzle to the wall or I go two meters uh, away. So the quality of the shot grid on the wall will be completely different. So this has to be trained. We uh, set up uh, training in our underground research training uh, center. We set up trainings for miners because we see that this is a really lack. And this is a mining group who was trained. The training, uh, the full training in our center lasts four months. So all the miners have to be there four months. They learn how to operate all machines, drilling, blasting, uh, every single process has to be trained. They get a certificate afterwards. Uh, I mean, one could shorten that down, uh, but it cannot be done on the construction site. This is what we learned, because construction companies are in a hurry. They have no time to train the uh, people. That's why we set it up together with the construction industry. So intensive training is required. Uh, we have to contact the shortage of skilled workers to ensure quality uh, in construction. Because otherwise we can design whatever we want when the others who are building that are not able to build it in reality. Uh, the other question is uh, how are the site managers and the engineers trained? Because if they don't even know how to set the bolt, is also a catastrophic situation. So that uh, what you see here is um, uh, my students group and all my students have to work underground in the center to set all the different boards that they are completely knowing how to set it. And they learn how to drive uh, a big uh, lorry and all the machines and uh, how to shot grid and uh, how to set up uh, the, the blasting material. Even uh, women are fully integrated in the training. If they would like to get a site manager later on, they have to pass the full training. No way, no way. Uh, we can design whatever we want. If we, if we are not able to, to bring that to the construction site, it's a big catastrophic. This is my group uh, who did the training this year. If you would like to see how we do that, uh, go on this simple uh, homepage, zab.at. Uh, uh, you see films there, how we do it, uh, how we do the training there. Uh, that's it. Um, to be clear uh, how it works, we have an um, idealized uh, construction site uh, organigram, which means we have a site supervision, of course, the client and the construction company, uh, and we need a geotechnical engineer good related to the geological documentation team and the geotechnical monitoring team. 
Geotechnical engineers should be uh, directly uh, connected with the designer. We have an independent control, of course, health and safety, a tunneling expert if something goes wrong, uh, also uh, clear. But this would be an EDR uh, construction organization that all these points which I was speaking of are clear, uh, clearly controlled. Just uh, some words, if you give me some more minutes uh, for the hard rock conditions, it's clear it was this design in the past. Huh? We had the drainage pipes, we had no, uh, let's say, uh, invert to be done. This is a clear hard rock uh, condition, horseshoe shape profile, no way. But we are coming into more and more soft ground conditions, so how do we do in soft ground conditions? Normally in soft ground, we, we have a geometry like this, we have a temporary invert, we have some elephant foot, as you see, we have some boards, even in, uh, uh, of course, soft rock, uh, to get the shear failure uh, avoided, and then we have the bench uh, done at once, and then we have the invert done at once. Uh, from the longitudinal section, we can go ahead with this uh, top heading, following them normally by bench and invert in a certain uh, uh, distance. Uh, only this, if we do the temporary invert, can, can be uh, go, uh, going ahead. In subway construction, we are a little bit more critical. This is a typical picture from Vienna subway. Uh, here we are getting the bench quite close to the uh, top heading. We have to uh, be sure that the face keeps stable so that we have long boards in the face. Um, and uh, bench and invert are done at once. And you see we also close the ring in such situations. So this is, um, say, seven meter diameter subway tunnel. Here we, we don't allow to make this uh, invert and so on. Just an example from a very low uh, overburden construction site in Germany, uh, where we had to do this design, as I said. Uh, extra to this uh, temporary invert, we also had these foot piles and uh, a strong, uh, let's say, face sporting and then bench invert afterwards done. Face uh, uh, pipe roofs. By Bruce, 15 to 20 meter long, give you a good uh, feeling for the pre-deformation, as I said. And if we don't want to have any settlements on surface, we have to follow, let's say, this more complicated, more serious uh, construction, which has these side walls. One is uh, going ahead, the other is following, and then followed by the main top heading and bench and core. Um, and uh, never go with this sidewalk to the same uh, situation because then you get a much too big uh, face uh, at once. So here are these uh, different sequences, uh, how it is built. We, we have written a book on that, so I could hand over e e a, a book on, on how to do that. I would send it to those who would be interested in that. We have all these sketches uh, brought in there. Uh, so, uh, of course, the design has to consider this cross-section, and what I want to figure out with this is we have to study every construction step. So, construction step one is to build just this tube, and then we uh, have uh, deformations, and the deformations can be seen, and these deformations can be measured. Yeah? So you have a control if the, what you designed is really going on on site, and then construction step two. And then construction, construction steps three and four. So all construction steps have to be in detail calculated following the deformations. And I just brought one, uh, one construction step with me. Also the bending moments, the shear forces, the normal forces, they have to be calculated for every construction step because this can be controlled in detail by monitoring for every construction step is essential. Uh, we had once a designer uh, coming with the full cross-section. I told him uh, in the construction sequences, he said, I have no money for that. Now, I'm sorry, we, we are building a serious uh, uh, construction here. So it's a, in, a huge investment. We cannot say, okay, little money in the design. I, I don't care on the, the, on, the, on the construction steps. So we have to. It's essential. It looks like, uh, like this then. Uh, and of course, then we already start with the monitoring and the monitoring tells us the truth. Are we now meeting the truth, yes or no? Just one last uh, point, newest development uh, on squeezing rock conditions. You see that we have uh, the slots in the shot grid shell. Um, there were elements designed for that. You see that we have these cylinders in so that you can take very high deformations. 
At Semmering Base Tunnel, it's a double tube system, 23 kilometers long. Right now, we have one meter of uh, radial deformation. One meter, uh, radial means two meters radial deformation. 900 meter overburden, uh, all at all. And uh, these elements were developed around 2000. Yeah? These are so-called yielding elements. But these yielding elements were heavy. There's such an element has a uh, hundred kilograms to heave up. The miners don't like it. So um, uh, if you look to the ground reaction curve, uh, is this element which meets now the ground reaction curve, this is the support line with these, let's say, uh, yielding elements. And uh, you see how they deform, but they were so heavy. Uh, at, an, a, another kind of uh, yielding elements was then developed by Bochumer Eisenhütte. And now I tell you, I'm really happy that there is a very young dynamic engineer on this site who developed a completely new system, which is consisting of this HS EPS, which is, uh, let's say, um, uh, a plastic, a kind of plastic. Uh, and this uh, plastic can take these high loads and we now uh, uh, taking in into these slots these elements. Has almost no weight and has a completely perfect resistance. He's making his PhD on that. And it works perfect um, uh, in the Semmering uh, base tunnel already and on many construction, other construction sites. His name, by the way, is uh, Mr. Entfellner. Those who are joining our uh, ITASET uh, lunchtime series will have seen him maybe, because we do that all, uh, all every uh, second Tuesday in the month. This is the element, really easy to heave up. The miners like it very much. You can cut it down with a length, whatever you need. If your round length is extending, you, you put an element which is longer or a shorter one. And you can also, by having these elements climb together, uh, certify, uh, let's say, how thick it is. Yeah, and by the bolts we developed, because we saw often these uh, damaged bolts, just these uh, rings, steel rings underneath the bolts so that they also can deform. With this, uh, I'm through the ideas of NATM from the design uh, to the construction. I hope I was able to bring you the full concept uh, 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 to the audience. And uh, thanks for your attention. And I'm open for questions. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Galler. It was, I think, a very captivating talk. Uh, thank you once more. Uh, now I request Professor Debye to extend our gratitude for this profound talk by Dr. Robert Geller by giving a memento as a token of appreciation. Now I would like to invite Professor J.T. Shahu sir on stage to extend our gratitude towards Professor Debayan for his efforts in the coordination and management of this session by presenting a token of appreciation. Now we'll break, break, take a break uh, for tea and we'll resume at four. So welcome back to the uh, last technical session of the event, panel discussion on the theme, tunnel disaster and management strategies. And for this panel discussions, we have identified uh, five experts. So I request all the experts to come onto the dais, please. Professor Nick Barton, and Professor Loco, and Professor Robert Geller, please, and Mr. Arun Diman, and Dr. Bainashian Haas. Please join the stage. Please welcome them with a big round of applause, please. Thank you. Welcome.
thank you all for agreeing to part of the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Over the last two days, so we had uh, interesting lectures by all the eminent speakers. So we had actually 17 lectures given by 16 speakers across the globe. They have traveled long distances and covering various topics starting from uh, site investigation. What should be the quality of site investigation we need, whether it is hydrological, hydrogeological, and then uh, geological investigation, and then uh, geotechnical investigation. What is, how good we should have an investigation before we proceed to the design. And also, once you have the properties, how do you characterize them? And characterization of the rock mass properties, wherein we have a wide range of methods of rock mass quality assessment, which will be eventually used for the analysis and design of uh, tunnel and tunnel support systems, actually. And also, there were a few lectures which were covering on the instrumentation that are required while doing the construction of tunnels and what are the different construction techniques, whether it is NATM or TBM method, what challenges that we face. So all that have been uh, covered over the last two days and we have listened to that. And uh, the several challenges, what we face and what, how we should go about that have been addressed during the lecture also, but we thought through a panel discussions, we will come up with some a focused discussion points which may eventually help us to uh, take it forward from today for further, you know, our uh, work on the tunnels. I think the site investigation, all of us know that is always, you know, discussions happens, you know, what accuracy of investigation we need at what cost. And, you know, so this is always a thing uh, quantity and quality and the accuracy of investigation with which, you know, we have to uh, get the information for the uh, safe design and construction of the tunnel. There is always a debate and what extent and how much uh, money that we can afford. And most importantly, I feel at what stage we involve them and plan them. See, many a times, if you do not do a detailed planning of investigation, that may also end up in, you know, experiencing a hazards actually. So. Uh, maybe this could be one of the points that I think we may discuss. So, uh, how do we plan and at what stage and what detailed investigation, how accurate uh, we should capture and with the kind of advanced technologies that we have, how we can integrate it, these advanced technologies into the investigation. I think one point of discussion could be on that. And uh, another one is I think Unlike a general uh, foundation engineering problems in an uh, onshore condition, the construction of tunnels requires extensive input from geologists actually. And we work together as far as possible, geologists and rock engineers. But still there is a, a exchange of knowledge or whatever the gap of uh, understanding between the subjects. Do we need to strengthen that? I mean, I mean, I thought as a geotechnical engineer maybe this, is, this could be also one of the area. I mean, what way we can actually, we have been definitely already working, but how far we can further move ahead to have a, you know, kind of a, a better understanding and better exchange of knowledges, which will eventually you know, avoid the tunnel disaster. It will help us to design the tunnels better way. So maybe, I don't know, I'm just posing this question. Maybe it could be a point of discussion. Maybe experts are here, you can actually guide us. And the safety measures, you know, being although taken care, I think in the inaugural session also, uh, CMD uh, has mentioned that safety measure is important and there were suggestions that that could be an escape tunnel kind of conceptualized in the design stage itself for the, you know, safety of the things, but for an unexpected uh, extreme event. But then he also mentioned that the cost will escalate significantly high. And when in a similar rock conditions, when you construct a, an escape tunnel, even safety of that escape tunnel itself is also has to be ensured. So uh, conceptualizing such kind of thing, you know, for an extreme event, is it a good idea or what is that we should do rather than that, is there any other alternate thing that we can do uh, to ensure the safety of the tunnels? So all these things, you know, I mean, uh, becomes 
the point of discussion. I think I will request each panelist to address uh, the challenges related to tunnel disaster and uh, the management strategies, how we can move forward. And maybe I will request them to kindly restrict to five minutes by each of them. And then uh, eventually we'll uh, open the discussion to the floor. And about five to 10 minutes, we may have a discussion you know, from the floor questions and then discussion. And then finally, we may wind up. So may I now request uh, Professor Nick Barton to come and uh, share his views on this particular theme for five minutes. Thank you very much. Please welcome. You can speak from there also, fine. Yeah, there is a speak. I thought there was a catch that they put me in the middle here. The picture on the side, it looked much better, yeah? Okay, I've, I've written down three things, investigation, and then second, geologists communicating with engineers, and the third thing, safety measures, escape tunnel in brackets. So, I mean, Okay, I've been involved in a lot of projects <clears throat> around the world, but like from the beginning, more in Norway, I would say, because when I go abroad, it's because something may have gone wrong and they want an opinion, independent opinion. So in Norway, which will be the reflection of my comments, I mean, boreholes are very useful and uh, seismic refraction, shallow seismic refraction is very useful. Of course, then we get in the discussion how far beyond the, the uh, access area, the portal area, how, how, how deep the tunnel is, will we get much value from the continued use of refraction seismic along the tunnel route. As the cover increases, uh, it would be very helpful if there are road cuts. Any road cuts are extremely useful. I mean, even in terrain where you have deep weathering, you're going to get some value from road cuts because the road cut will be getting below the, the area of, of, of deep weathering. And you can do rock mass characterization of the road cuts. Uh, I did a lot, actually, probably about three, more than 300 road cuts for these TBM tunnels uh, south of Oslo, called Follobanen. And uh, it was not a perfect result. It was a huge statistic, but because the tunnel was, say, 30, 40, 50 meter depth rather than 20 meter depth, I was a little bit pessimistic on the rock quality. So I had a little bit lower Q values. I think it, the, the weighted mean was between 11 and 16. And they had, they had a an escape tunnel between these TBM tunnels for some kilometers, and there they did Q-logging in a drill and blast tunnel at a little bit deeper than my road cuts, yeah? And they had a quality closer to, say, 30 or 40 for Q. And this sounds very nice, but actually it was showing, uh, it, it caused the TBM to have a little bit more difficulty than I would have predicted in my model, because there was less jointing. And uh, even though they had uh, penetration rates of roughly two meter per hour, the, the final end of tunnel results of the A over R, the actual advance rate over, the, the advance rate over the about two year tunnel construction for nine kilometer north and nine kilometer going south, the AR was actually 0 0.5, so say 10, 12 meter per day average. So just because the, the rock was more massive than expected, and there was a whole set of seismic refraction results that I had not seen uh, between low velocity zones. There was, there was concentration on low velocity zones, what problem that would cause for the TBM and so on, and permeability and impermeabilization. Actually, one of the biggest problems was to pick up the the uh, higher velocity zone and the, the, the higher Q value and the greater difficulty in getting a good penetration rate because it's very hard with granites and gneisses, pegmatites and things. Um, so, uh, of course, boreholes, seismic refraction. 
and looking at rock cuttings is, is very useful, but be aware that <coughs> the quality is very likely to be better at greater depth, obviously. Uh, communication between geologists and engineers. I mean, in our country, Q has kind of come into the language, so engineer, engineers obviously use it, and, and geologists, engineering geologists, they, they are able to communicate with this, but they have much more important information to give us about uh, the, the fault zones and the, the structure and the, the reasons for high horizontal stresses, etc., etc. So it's always very useful to have uh, conversations with geologists and, and, and make sure you study their reports, yeah? I uh, mustn't use too many minutes here. So safety measures, the third topic. I mean, if we have twin tunnels, we can have these escape tunnels every 300 meter, and, and that in a way is Im improving the safety of a project if you have twin tunnels anyway, instead of a, a single big tunnel. And uh, so that, that's the logical way to have, to increase the safety without increasing the cost too much that you have twin tunnels instead of a possible double, double track tunnel, yeah? So I think I've used five minutes, so next person. Thank you, Professor Barton, yeah. So now I request uh, Mr. Lokholm to give his address. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Sort of on the investigation, especially for TBM tunnels, in, a, in, <clears throat> in the cities where the geology is known, the more investigation you do, the better. More co uh, core logging, the more information, the better, uh, the, uh, of course, the end result will be. But you should do it in a city because you've got a higher risk. You can't afford subsidence. You've uh, you got buildings. But in the Himalayas or any mountainous condition, <laughs> absolutely just about impractical to do a whole lot of drilling. Just uh, physically, you can't do it. And secondly, uh, expensive, very expensive. I'm a great proponent, and which we don't do in our industry, of doing more in tunnel as we go, geological investigation, mapping, and uh, and we don't, there isn't a tunnel that I can name that there's an experienced geotechnical guy in a TBM tunnel trying to analyze what's ahead of them and conveying that to the operator. We just don't have that in our systems, and we should have it in our systems. We should sort of oblige the geotechnical guys to be in the TBM with the operator, telling them, looking at the data, knowing what should be in front of them, and telling them, hey, here's how you should operate this machine for the next 20 meters. We just don't have that in the industry, and we should have it, because uh, we have all these good Q systems and other systems. I might understand half, but I'll bet you there isn't one operator in the world that understands one-tenth of it. So how can we expect him to adjust to these conditions when he's not even aware of them? So. Um, we don't do that in our industry, so we should do it. Uh, and the other thing about our modern TBMs, we should, uh, we can build a machine to go through just about anything. We have these new crossover machines that we can turn into EPB machines, hold the face, advance. We can convert them back to be open machines and take high rates of advance. Yeah, they're expensive, but as we tried to show in our paper yesterday, Hey, the expense can pay off in meters per month, and uh, don't get don't uh, get overwhelmed by the cost of these machines. Uh, just try to get it right for the conditions. Safety-wise, I think um, clearly, if you see it, I can't even remember uh, in a line tunnel when we've had an accident that uh, of any big degree. Yeah. What we do lack in, in um, line tunnels is a flexibility on lining. We tend to go to uh, the lining for worst case and imply the worst Im install the worst case lining for 90 percent of a tunnel where we don't need the worst case lining. And uh, so we have to correct that going forward to have more adaptable lining systems for the ground conditions that we encounter. We over 
uh, <coughs> complicate our lining in a lot of ways. So those are my three and a half minute sessions, so I'm, I'm going to give it up here. Thank you, Mr. Uh, may I now request uh, Mr. Arun Diman to share his views, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I have been involved in the construction of an Atpa Jakri project, the largest desilting chambers in the world, uh, which have some, some of the cavities in there. Uh, and after that one, the Rampur hydroelectric project and a hydro tunnel of 15 kilometer long. And uh, we were encountered with 54 smaller and bigger cavities into there. But yes, uh, the biggest one is Kasholi. I think Sanjeev has already yesterday told about that one. The 50, our uh, collapse was almost a 52, 54 meter of a collapse of the tunnel was there. We bypassed it. And we treated it with our, uh, just to decrease the time, just to gain the time. We bypassed it, the tunnel cavity. And uh, when cavity was through, our HRT was also through at that time. Uh, about uh, investigation, I think, uh, because I am more to the construction side, I do agree with that investigation has to be there. But uh, to my construction view of that one, it doesn't much more help in a hydro sector for that one. I think to do the bigger holes in that one. We as an engineer, I as an engineer, find it out. Uh, we have to treat the thing. We have to treat the because we are playing against the nature for doing excavation and everything. So we have to be ready with all the sets of uh, uh, these uh, things, uh, like four poles, grouting, and everything, which have been designed by uh, our geotechnical engineers and that one. Though we can do that one. I think uh, that is from investigation part of view, because investigation itself has a bigger cost for us. For an hydro sector, we have to be restricted about the uh, cost of the power which has to be sailed about. It is not like the uh, highway tunnels or like that one. So we have to be in a uh, 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 close circle about that. I think for geology part, I think our geologists are always with us for that one. In every blast, like uh, I think Mr. Barton and everybody told, okay, in a geology sector, uh, they help it out. Every After every blast, they see the face. They put up the rock bolts and that one, whatever rock bolt, whatever shortcut has been done. Mm, so I do agree with that one, that geology has to be an integral part of uh, construction of that one. About safety measures, like uh, just we had uh, one escape and cell carrier tunnel just now. After that one, there was a safety, what has to be done for that one. Uh, in my view, I think that uh, well, there was a one suggestion in that one too. We have to put a pipe all through long the tunnels to if their cavities are occur. We do, uh, we have already done that part in our uh, Arun 3 project. But it was only on the parts to just cut off the cost. We have already done in the past where movements of the rocks are there. Cavities, there are the nature where cavities can be formed. We have already done for it, uh, almost 20 to 29 meter. We have put in uh, the steel pipe within concrete on that one so that that safety can be done up. I think the, uh, what uh, we suggest, the panel is suggesting about uh, to put up a parallel tunnel in that one. So in a hydro sector, it is a little difficult job for doing it up for that one, to go for a parallel tunnel and then do all those things. But yes, safety measures with the moment, moment noting by paper targets or extension meters or that one, that has to be there for that. And uh, for, I think, in Arun 3 also, we had, uh, uh, we had just recently, in two, two months before, we had our uh, diversion tunnel uh, cave in after two years of running of that one. So uh, because of the slope on that one, but uh, we treated it, we retreated it, and we are ready to redivert the river again for that one. I think uh, that's the way. I think uh, this is all from me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Diman. Thank you very much. And may I request uh, Professor Galler to share his views? Yep, thank you. Uh, regarding the investigation, uh, everything starts, I think, with the contractual form which you choose. 
Um, we are normally choosing the model uh, design, bit, build, which means design is always done on the, cont uh, on the client side, then we tender it, and then uh, we do the detail design also on the client side. Might maybe be a little bit different from uh, how you're doing it, I don't know. Uh, but this mainly drives uh, the risk because we have a clear, uh, clear uh, let's say, uh, agreement in the standard that all the risk regarding the geology is on the client side. So the construction company is responsible for the risk on the means and methods. So if they choose, for example, a wrong machine, uh, a wrong tunnel boring machine or a wrong other machine, then it's on their side. And if the machine is not running, it's the risk. Everything is on their side. And if they have um, uh, miners who are not well educated, it's on their side. It's not the client side. But everything what is on the geology, it's on the client side. And this, of course, brings the client in the situation that he will do the best what he can do. Even if we do a flexible contract, as I tried to explain, the client will try to do the best prognosis ever, uh, and so he does, and we saw today some charts, how many meters of, um, of drill cores do we do before we start a project. And this was, uh, uh, was fitting uh, also good how we did it. Um, now, as you all know, we are coming to the, uh, let's say, life of BIM, uh, building information modeling. So what we are trying to do is we're setting up a prognosis model and then we do uh, the geology update, let's say, on a daily basis. So there are programs like LeapFrog from Australia. We in Austria have the good Dugis. And there are programs available where you can update uh, your geology uh, by more and more investigation. And uh, the uh, investigation, uh, because I fully agree, we, we should do investigation at the phase as, as much as we can. Uh, for these, for example, for tunnel boring machines, we developed a, a phase monitoring system. So every time when we stop the machine, we have uh, several cameras. We tried it just in, at the Brenner Base Tunnel now. Uh, we tried it at Corm already, so that we make a face and fully automated face mapping uh, without, let's say, in a subjective influence of any geologist. So we make films and photos which you can watch, and then it's very clear what it is. And same we do, of course, in, in, in ATM uh, drives. Um, regarding the safety measures, uh, here again, I would like to split uh, into two stages. The one, and, and we always begin with the stage safety in the operation. So if, if one is, is, let's say, designing a motorway tunnel, bidirectional traffic, and this is long and has no second tube, it's very clear that we have to escape about this, uh, over the ceiling. So there is no motorway design for a motorway tunnel, uh, I mean, uh, where you cannot escape. So we, it's automatically clear that we need a ceiling so that on the cross passage, which normally connects one tube with the other, in this case, you have a ramp also for the handicapped people. <clears throat> so the handicapped people can come up to the ceiling and escape uh, along the ceiling, for example. If you have a second tube, as we heard already, then you escape via the cross passages. So this is for the operation phase very clear. For the uh, construction stage, uh, we made uh, tests with all the fire brigades responsible for, for this special, uh, let's say, tunnel. And what we learned is that this is impossible from the condition of the fire brigade's men and the rescue teams to rescue somebody who is far away than 1.5 kilometers. Because uh, you, you have to be so trained if you want to carry somebody out of this uh, uh, zone that uh, it's more or less impossible to, to do that. So uh, this, uh, this uh, brings a rule that, that there has to be a possibility to come with the rescue teams at least 1.5 kilometers close to the face in a safe way, either for the second tube, uh, so that you, if you have two tubes, uh, you do not allow that the second tube is far away than 1.5 kilometers. I, I don't know how, how, how good trained your rescue teams are, but this is the experience from our country. More than 1.5 kilometer cannot be done because nobody is trained up like this that he can carry out somebody 
in, uh, I have to say, in our country, this is a fire brigade, to be a fire brigade uh, man is a volunteer job. So we have no professional fire brigades, uh, just in some cities, but, but not for construction sites. And these trainings uh, for the safety have to be done on a regular basis. We do these trainings latest every six months. So every six months, all the team, we, we play uh, any, uh, let's say, accident. Uh, we don't tell them uh, this accident somebody, but we train this accident, which ne nobody knows, just a few people know, and then we see how fast it goes. This is a rule, every six months this has to be trained. Um, this doesn't drive up the cost, in my opinion, because I wrote down there some cost escalation. I mean, uh, for the cost, um, uh, just to be clear, on the very beginning of a project, we, we also wrote a cost determination guideline, which is also available on the UGG uh, homepage. Uh, we, we have to make a risk study, and then we have base cost, which we have uh, clearly stated in a certain design stage, and we have to um, let's say, consider the valorization of the price development. And this we have to tell the client in a very early stage. So if a construction site, let's say, lasts 10 years, then it's very clear that the escalation of the cost is there because of inflation. And we have to tell the client in the earliest stage what is the amount of escalation if this uh, construction lasts, let's say, 10 years or so. And the risk study has to be done, and this both has to be added to the normal designed cost of a project. Uh, yeah, that's it from my point. Uh, I mean, communication uh, with the designer, just one word. The geotechnical engineer should be working in the design already. So the geotechnical engineer, which we sort out for the construction, comes from the designer's team. And there shouldn't be in any other, because the, if you take any other for the geotechnical engineer, he has no idea what was in the design. So he should be the designer in best case, geotechnical designer, and then he's the one who moves to the construction site because he knows best what he has designed, and he is maybe the only who can do the recalculation. If you take somebody else, uh, I don't know if he can do the recalculation of all the things which are happening on site. This was my statement. Thank you, Professor Geller. I may now request Dr. Haas to give his views, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would prefer to give a general comment uh, about this aspect. Actually, in uh, tunneling, we have uh, four main phases, pre-design, design, construction, and post-construction phases. If you want to uh, improve the safety, for example, in this procedure, it cannot be seen individually. Uh, safety will come with time and will cost. So we need to see all of these three aspects in these four phases to be able to have a safe tunneling. Um, based on the experience I've, I had in India in the last seven years, I would recommend uh, some points that it can improve this industry in India, including the investigation, improvement in investigation, specifically using the geophysical methods before design in the pre-phase. Using the right design approach, which is sometimes missing, using right design procedure, using applicable classifications for the stratas that you are working in or you are going to design the project for. Using suitable characterization systems, using um, proper tunneling method and differentiating it from the excavation methods. I have seen that in India uh, due to very simple mistakes. Sometimes things go wrong. So, I would recommend to understand the difference between the tunneling method and the excavation techniques for the tunnels. We need in India to train engineers, as Dr. Geller stated in his uh, lecture. It's a very key point. Engineers, geologists, designers, technicians, and even foremen, they need proper training. Contracts 
requires to be improved. It should be rewritten. I have gone through several contracts in several projects in several places of India. I believe contracts, tunneling contracts in India needs to be rewritten. It should be revised. Documentation, which is missing. Documentation of the lessons we are getting from projects. A lot of money spent to construct the projects. A lot of failures, collapses happened and rectified. Where is the documentation for? And what is the lesson obtained? Vibration-induced damage assessment. I strongly recommend this missing part to come to the picture in tunneling industry in India and modern technology. Still, we are seeing designs that uh, sticking on very old style designs. In many places, I have seen that wire mesh is in use, while simply can be replaced with the fiber reinforced shot crete or concrete. I believe with these simple things, however, it needs more attention and investment on, things will be improved and the safety will be guaranteed. Uh, deadlines would be guaranteed. We will not have any more projects that can be conducted in two to three years for over 20 years. So, so this is my comments on this matter. I hope that it can be effective. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ross, for the views. Now I open question from the floors if you have any specific question. Yeah, please. Uh, all these speakers, uh, 16, 17 speakers spoke very well. Uh, my questions to the uh, panelists, particularly Dr. Robert, whom I just interacted for a few seconds. See, is a computer age where everything that we need to make model. Now, how to ensure that this model that we are making, physical or, or whatever is the, the right model, and the data that we get out of that is reliable, because everything design is based on this. Now, coming to the monitoring side, we need monitoring by putting instrumentation sensors right at the planning stage, uh, then construction stage, and then all such structures have, say, under your life. Now, the data that we have been collect we are collecting through putting sensors, then for 100 years, what is the mechanism of to see that the data that we have collected are being collected during use? is usable, which can ensure our proper health monitoring. So this is my question to the panelists. Um, if I may uh, start with the answer. Uh, first of all, the monitoring, uh, short grid utilization, uh, deformation, and so, is majorly used for the construction is majorly used for the construction because you have to compare your design results with the one which you have really on site to realize also, okay, there's a geotechnical change from the prognosis to the realization. And we need most of these results during construction till the finalization before we bring in the inner lining, if we do a double shell lining. Um, for the life cycle, for the 100 years, we have a complete other system for watching what is going on here. But this is majorly, uh, let's say, uh, based on glass fiber lines in the inner lining. This is, um, for the moment, the state of the art what we are doing. For example, at the Brenner base, uh, we are building uh, in glass fibers in or the segmental lining elements. Uh, to, to be able to decide, do we really need an inner lining, yes or no? And these glass fibers, we, for the moment, expect have a very high lifetime. Nobody can say if they will uh, uh, take uh, the life for 100 years, 
then we have to change uh, anything when it's uh, when it's over. Um, here we have no experience uh, right now, but we, what we hope is that they will work, for, yeah, very long. Let's let's call it this way. Hundred years, I cannot sign. <laughs> so, uh, ju Thank you. just Thank you. can I have another question? Uh, this is basically with uh, uh, Dr. Geller. Uh, I asked this earlier also, but uh, I could not understand. We are using NATM here in India very much in all tunnel design and construction. Uh, I would like to know, uh, we'd like to adopt your system, which you are having that uh, changing of the cost as the ground uh, quality condition changes based on that chart. That's very good system, but uh, will not be the final cost to the client unknown before the construction and if it increases because the most of the clients are government agencies in India. So uh, how to budget that beforehand because the, these uh, you have to make some estimation and then give to the if budget is too high then your project gets delayed government has no money if it is too uh, small a cost then it is uh, if cost increases then we don't have money to pay so how to overcome this particular uncertainties in the Please elaborate on this. Yeah, uh, this directly goes, the, uh, goes into the cost determination. As I mentioned, if you go on the, our website, OGG, uh, AT, you will find a guideline also in English available how to determine cost uh, in an early stage. Uh, what we do is we do a sensibility analysis. So we, we do the cost determination with the most, uh, let's say, most probable geology. And this most probable geology gives us the base cost of the project. Then we do a sensibility analysis. What in case the geology gets worse? This drives us to another cost. But this is not the cost which we, uh, let's say, give to the client. But we tell him there is a risk. Please res uh, make a risk reserves in your budget. Because it could happen that geology is worse than was described. And then we do a sensibility analysis also on the other side. It could get better. So we have a risk scenario. And this risk scenario is added to the design cost. So we have design cost based on the most probable geology. Then we have risk cost. What can happen if it gets worse? This is a, uh, uh, a quite big amount. The earlier we are in the design stage, of course, in the conceptual design, this risk cost is uh, much, much higher than in the approval cost, is higher than in the tender design, because you always get some more information because you uh, do not stop, let's say, uh, uh, work on the investigation. And the further you come with your project, uh, the smaller your risk gets, because you will bypass uh, uh, let's say the the fault zone one and the fault zone two and so on. So uh, the important point is to add the risk cost to the budget, and the client knows how high this risk is. I would never tell it to the construction company because if they know, okay, the client has reserved this money, they will try to get to the risk budget. This is our experience. If we open it, okay, we have reserved risk budget for this. The construction company immediately starts to look for the risk budget, plus the normal budget. On the other side, uh, as I said, this is just to consider the geology changes. Uh, we, we must not forget the valorization. This is also in long-term projects a quite high amount of uh, budget. Was that clear for you? Okay. Thank you. I will use the word ecosystem is somehow missing in the in India. Uh, India is doing a very very huge amount of tunneling. Simultaneously, being a large, very geographically large country okay. with diverse geographies okay. and uh, diverse type of organizations are actually simultaneously working. Yes. They may not even be knowing you know the work culture of each and others also. So there is a diversity and, and the you know the type of uh, you know formation also. So, uh, so anyhow, that has to be you know, corrected. You know, that is very, very clear. I think uh, most of us agree with that. That there is a need to correct the ecosystem, and ecosystem is involved, you know, 
huge that 10 to 12 factors which you rightly indicated and pointed out. Uh, but my question is uh, a very, very vital one from my side that uh, when we were doing you know, a few tunneling uh, projects, let's say 10, 20 in a parallel, now we are doing probably 100, then we used to have a client side design. But that client side design was not uh, the client side design consultant, it was client side in house design. There is a difference between client side in house design mm -hmm. and client side design consultant. Right. And there are the item rate contract. In item rate contract, the quantity variation risk is automatically taken by the client. Right. Then what is left is the time risk. The time risk is somehow passed on to the contractor and then there is also a way of time ex through a time extension and all that. There is some kind of uh, you know compensation mechanism. But question is now there is a contractor side of design. And contractor style design means contractor, and then he employs some contractor side design consultant, and it is an EPC contract. Yeah. And on these projects, when the origins are ambitious, what is happening without, with, with a very, very little information, they will uh, you know, say, okay, make this tunnel in 24 months and all that, without knowing that 24 months, even the access may not be available to the portals. Correct. And uh, then this, uh, when the client side designs are there, what my observation is, there is a huge amount of, uh, you know, what we are as uh, compromise, right. right in the, you know, the design proposal stage and all that. So how do you think this affects the quality and, uh, you know, reliability of uh, the tunnels that we are going to build and the, you know, that, uh, you know, because they have to operate for 100 years. That is my question. Thank you. Before, before Dr. Haas reply, I request the questions to be very concise, please. Thank you. Um, it's a very good question, and you used a very good term for that, ecosystem of design. I believe, as you rightly said, that ecosystem, if this ecosystem is corrected, doesn't matter design is conducted by client in-house or by consultant of the client or by the EPC through the contractor. So uh, this ecosystem, that uh, this procedure, that 12 points that I said, it's not difficult to correct it. Only the key point is that we take lesson from all of the things that are happening and we document it. If it is documented, it would be available for everyone. So lessons would be learned from every aspect, if it is client, if it is contractor, or if it is a consultant. So I believe this ecosystem only should be corrected. And for, the, for, for sure, it would reflect in all aspects of the tunneling in India. Okay, okay. Uh, one word that has barely been mentioned in this symposium is the word reliability. We still in the tunneling industry are working mainly on factor of safety design, which in the field of tunneling is totally inadequate. We need to move to a reliability based design. So my question is, how do we promote a reliability based design in our industry with the designer with the contractor and with the owner and show the benefit of a reliability-based design. Thank you. Thank you. Factor of safety alone is inadequate, okay? You have to have an estimate also of the probability of failure. Which one would you say? Say, a, pro a project that has a factor of safety of 1.5 or a project that has a probability of one times 10 to the minus three of failure? Totally different. So you need to have estimated risk, which is uh, essentially uh, related to probability of failure. That has to come because... We, yeah. yeah, yeah, so sorry. Uh, I think, yeah, thank you for your view, Professor Marte. Thank you. I think there was one, because we can take up a couple of more questions. I think we have a closing tea outside. I request because closing ceremony is also there. We have just two minutes to wind up this session. Good evening, all the experts uh, sitting on dais. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Geller. Um, uh, in your presentation, you have just mentioned about how to take care of the contractual issues, how best we can define it thereby having certain control onto the cost curtailment or defining the cost in a uh, justified way. 
that if it is increasing or decreasing. My question in that is, at the prognosis stage, you said that uh, uh, how best we can define the classification of the whole tunnel based on which the time variation is there whether it will be finished beforehand or it will be depending upon when we progress along the tunnel excavation, uh, actual execution of the work at site, we'll be coming to know that. But how to go about uh, define that prognosis? Because, uh, because uh, in uh, during uh, Dr. Barton in his uh, presentation has clearly brought out it cannot be one single borehole that along the tunnel we are going about and then we are defining the things. And right now, uh, Dr. Haas also talked about, yeah, uh, that uh, geophysical investigations are required to be there. In previous day presentation, one of our presenters has mentioned that, uh, I tell you, this is a very important and everybody is going to appreciate, let me complete, um, that uh, this, uh, 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 there are certain sites we cannot have proper geological mapping because outcrop is not visible there or the, that the sites are inaccessible. Uh, then how to go about that prognosis also because a lot of variations are there. Again, we enter into the contextual issues. So is there, we can talk about physical methods. In some cases, they are also very difficult in Himalayan region where we are having the remotely at 3,000 meter location, 2,800, 500 meter location, we are having the, that too we are having the tunnels over there at such uh, elevations. Then how to define to certain extent what all surveys we can talk about. If there is anything you can bring out to us that will be really helpful to all of us sitting over here. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I mean, uh, I think I can give an uh, answer to you and try to give an answer also uh, to your question because this is more or less the same. Uh, uh, the, the point is that in an approval design, which we get then approved by the ministry, we have to uh, bring up a design concept. I call it concept because we are working on a prognosis as good as we can. Uh, and, and you have some things available, but uh, always think that these are just needles, uh, what you did with the boreholes before, and you brought some geophysics in between your needles. And geophysics is then setting up uh, on the information, on, on the borehole information which you had there. Anyhow, based on this information, you do a design best as you can. This is the job of the designer, best as he can do a design. But of course, we know that this might not be the design which then comes into operation during construction because there are some, let's say, surprises when you uh, go through the tunnel. Now, um, because you were talking about the safety factor, my answer is there is, uh, it is, it is impossible to talk about a safety factor. You can only have a base a geology which you assume or got from samples uh, calculated with uh, uh, some, some of the formulations which we heard based on UDEC, 3DEC, uh, uh, FLAG, whatever. You do the best what you can. You cannot say uh, this is a reliable design. You did the best what you can. And now you ask the construction company, okay, what is the velocity with this design? You have, let's say, 10 different design drawings for the different sections of your tunnel, maybe in some, in some cases more. And for every design drawing, you ask the construction company, what is the velocity? Tell me what is the velocity? And he then promises, okay, he can do, if this design comes to operation, comes to construction, he can do one meter a day, three meters a day, whatever he can. And he's, he tells you this velocity for every single design drawing which you hand over. During construction, you have to decide based on monitoring and then you see uh, what is the safety factor because you see a utilization degree of your shot grid is 20%, for example, then you automatically can count this is really my safety factor. You measure the forces on the boards and then you can say, okay, I did too many boards or too less boards and then you decide how many boards you do, how thick your shot grid is and then you make the same drawing then you in the design, but for the construction. We call it a, a construction uh, uh, plan, which is signed by the construction company 
and signed by the engineer, in our case by the client. This is a, a major topic of NATM, by the way, that both agree this is now a safe construction based on the monitoring results and, um, and uh, uh, based on the geology which you meet. And this automatically can you now you can calculate the velocity for this uh, design which you brought to construction because you have your uh, raster, you have your matrix where you had already 10 different velocities in and now you just can interpolate, okay, we really did this, this amount of bolts, this amount of short grid, you can automatically interpolate between the existing uh, promises from the tender design and say, okay, this is now the velocity you promised during the contract adopted, of course, to the real geological conditions. This is how we do it. Is thank you. Thank clear? you, Professor Gellar. Thank you. Uh, Maybe there one, one last question, we'll take it Good up. Evening. Please don't mind, Excuse because me. we have to close, and we have time. I think after we close also, we have a small tea break. I think I request all the delegates to just discuss over there. I think Dr. Haas want to say something. I'll take up the last question after that. Thank you. In line with Dr. Gellar, and in response to your question, uh, actually, uh, in some cases, your tunnel is placed in a location that you would not be able to do comprehensive investigation. Sometimes that is a waste of money. But we will do as much as we can, but to be feasible by terms of time and economy. In tunnel, specifically in tunnel, we cannot design the tunnel A to Z before the work to start. It's not possible, and it is wrong. And actually, when you will be starting the work, you will be surprised with different things that change the design. We need to make a base design, but when we start the work, we will be optimizing it as we advance in tunnel. So, we will do the investigation as much as possible, but logically, right? We start the work, then we revise the design. So we will make it optimized. Thank you, Dr. Haas. Hello. One, one last question. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, in context of Himalayas, uh, maybe uh, this is a very simple question or maybe complex. In terms of Himalayas, what is the best uh, rock classification, RMR or Q value, in terms of Himalayas? And secondly, uh, what is the best way to select a TBM? Uh, we do a lot of investigation, then we select either we should go for double shield or gripper, or we should straight away take the past experience and we uh, select a machine. Or finally, uh, either uh, we should go fully equipped machine with crossover, uh, uh, the costly one. What is the best way to select a TBM for any project in Himalayas? Um, regarding the, um, uh, which uh, RMR, Q, look, uh, in our industry, we understand both of them, and, all, and we try to understand all of them. All of them give benefit. They should all be considered in uh, certain weights, uh, depending on what, what you're looking for. If you've got a really hard rock and uh, consistent rock, Q helps you a lot in determine cutter costs, advance rates. RMR is always important for ground support. So all of these have to be considered. The key on what type of machine and what features, uh, I'm a great advocate of uh, over-designing the machine and um, having it available to put uh, act as, let's say, an EPP, earth pressure machine, and the same machine without too much time and without too much extra cost be able to get those high advance rates because you need, if you want to average two, uh, 400 meters a month, you need a lot of 800 meter months. That's the only way you can average 400 meters. So you got to have a lot of horsepower and uh, just power in the machine. If you want good advance rates, you need a whole lot of power. <laughs> That's just a fact. and. Uh, that's pretty common sense. If you want to uh, win the race in a race uh, track, you got to have the fastest, most powerful machine. 
And uh, that's, in simple terms, the best answer I can give you. Maybe Thank you. What Thank you, Mr. Edon, uh, before you, uh, you give the answer. I just recommend, of course, Q, RMA, try all of them, but don't forget, try also the Austrian concept. This is uh, not taking... <laughs> <laughs> try it. Well said from an Austrian. <laughs> yeah, concerning Q and RMR, I mean, if we're talking TBM, there is something called QTBM, and there's also something called RME. And RME, I believe, it only makes a prediction for like 24-hour advance rate, which to me is totally inadequate. Penetration rate is also inadequate to tell you the likely number of years a, a tunnel of 10 kilometer, 15 kilometer will take. So my preference, of course, would be Q combined with QTBM, yeah? Especially for making these advance rates predictions with the deceleration with time after the learning curve. Things like that that most people are optimistically forgetting. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I think uh, give a big round of applause to the panelists as well as delegates for, you know, uh, for a very good discussion and deliberations. And thank you so much for patiently, you know, listening to the deliberations. Now, I think please stay back. We will quickly uh, reassemble for the closing ceremony, for a short closing ceremony. And please stay back. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody for uh, having a wonderful discussion. So we have come to an uh, end of the two days deliberation. And as I have mentioned, we had uh, 16 originally planned lectures uh, delivered by 15 experts. And I think we had a, a special lecture added by one of our pioneering rock engineer, Professor T. Ramamurthy, sir. We were really honored by his presence all two days and then so on total, we had actually 16 lectures covered over two days and by all uh, stalwarts and eminent speakers across the world. I mean, I'm, I'm really overwhelmed and enjoyed. I'm sure all of us have enjoyed. Let us give a big round of applause to all the speakers who had made this uh, symposium a really grand success. And coming to delegates, we have Delegates coming from 64 I mean, uh, different organizations. And it's really great that you all have taken initiative and then to join us. We have 20 PSUs and then 12 public organizations and 32 private organizations. It's really a mixture of, you know, the stakeholders and the industry. And a big round of applause to them, you know, for taking part on the last two days, you know, sacrificing the weekend. <laughs> and really, you know, making this event a great success. On total, we have about 257 delegates, you know, attendees, and again, representing different organizations. This includes, of course, about 25 student volunteers who have been working as, I always believe these student volunteers in an academic institute are the pillars for, you know, coordination of such events, actually. So can we give them the big round of applause, you know, who have been working tirelessly over the last, you know, few weeks and making this event happening, you know, in a successful way. Thanks to them. And that's all is the summary from my side. And uh, now I invite uh, Mr. Uh, Sushil Sharma to have uh, a closing remarks of the symposium. Thank you. Distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, and fellow enthusiasts of tunneling technology, as we gather here today to conclude this remarkable symposium on tunneling, I am filled with a profound sense of accomplishment and gratitude. Over the past two days, we have witnessed a vibrant exchange of ideas, a deep exploration of cutting edge advancements, and a collective reaffirmation of the transformative power of tunneling. The presence of experts in tunneling has been a source of great inspiration for all of us. These legends in the field of tun tunneling have
have provided valuable insights on the important aspects of tunneling which we in hydropower sector can utilize in our projects and also in other sectors. The art of tunneling as we know it has evolved over millions of years, transcending geographical boundaries and uniting civilizations. From the rudimentary tunneling works of ancient Rome to the awe-inspiring metro networks of modern cities and various underground works in hydro stations, tunneling has consistently pushed the boundaries of human ingenuity and reshaped our landscapes. Today, we stand at a pivotal juncture in tunneling history. The challenges we face from urban congestion to environmental concerns demand innovative solutions that can seamlessly integrate infrastructure with our natural ecosystems. Tunneling with its unparalleled ability to connect communities and transport resources efficiently holds the key to unlocking a sustainable and interconnected future. During this symposium, we had delved into the intricacies of tunneling techniques from the traditional drill and blast method to the more sophisticated advancements in tunnel boring machines. We have explored the intricacies of geotechnical engineering, safety protocols, and environmental considerations, all of which are paramount to the successful execution of tunneling projects. The presentations and discussions that have taken place here have illuminated the diverse applications of tunneling technology from transportation infrastructure to water con conveyance system, energy pipelines, and even scientific research facilities. Each project in its own unique way demonstrates the transformative impact of tunneling on our world. We have considered the role of tunneling enhancing urban mobility, promoting sustainable development, and fostering economical growth. As we conclude this symposium, I am confident that we carry with us a renewed sense of purpose and a shared commitment to advancing the field of tech tunneling. The knowledge and insights we have gained will undoubtedly fuel further breakthroughs and innovation in the years to come. We in SJVN have tried to bring this important topic to limelight in collaborations with the prestigious IIT Delhi. This is a humble beginning from our side to make IIT Delhi a center of excellence in tunneling in times to come. The coming together of academia and professionals in the field of tunneling will surely promote dissemination of knowledge to the society, students, and engineering fraternity. I also feel that such conferences and symposium should be a regular feature. In fact, it should be held at least once in a year. We in SJV and NIT would welcome further suggestions for improvement in conducting such sessions and conferences. We are sure that in association with IIT, we will definitely incorporate such suggestions in the future. I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to the organizing committee for their tireless efforts in bringing this symposium to fruition. I am also thankful to all the distinguished sp speakers, panelists, learned professors, and all involved in the symposium. So, as we depart from this gathering, let us carry with us the spirit of collaboration, innovation, dedication that has characterized this uh, symposium. Let us continue to push the boundaries of technical technology, ensuring that it remains a driving force for progress and sustainable sustainability in our ever-changing world for, a, for the cause of common man. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sri Sharma Ji, for delivering the closing remarks. Uh, may I now invite uh, Professor A.K. Nima, Head, Civil Engineering Department, IIT Delhi, to deliver his address. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Ayati Raman. Uh, I am sort of one person who is odd man out. I am not really into tunneling. My area is environmental engineering. But when SGBN approached IIT Delhi, Department of Civil Engineering, I was super excited that this area is one which needs a thrust from the institute like IIT Delhi, Department of Civil Engineering. And I congratulate the group, which is Geotechnical Engineering Group, under the leadership of uh, Professor Ayuti Raman and Professor Ramana, who took the challenge forward. And I believe in very short time, they could 
convince all the who's who of the tunneling in the world to come here, share their thoughts, and stir our minds that we need a giant stride in this area. India is doing wonderfully well in terms of economic development. We want to be as sustainable as possible. And this area is one where we need to work a lot together. I believe all the stakeholders will agree with me. And uh, just now my colleagues said that they are really happy to push the idea of having center of excellence in this area forward. I would like to say that we must have beyond that an institute which focuses on tunneling technology, state of the art. Across the world, we should con contribute and try to take this idea forward. Again, I must congratulate SGVN and IT Delhi Department of Civil Engineering for making this step forward and making this happen. I'm sure all of you must have enjoyed these two days. I could completely understand everybody must be feeling why two days. This was too short a time. We were not allowed to ask more and more and more questions. But this is how things are. Always there is going to be time constraint in anything you do, including tunneling. You saw our 41 people stuck and the time was of a sense. So time is always going to be like this. We have to work in this constraint. Thank you very much for being here, sharing your thoughts, and I'm sure we will take it forward further. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Nima, for uh, uh, encouraging words. Thank you very much. Uh, may I now invite uh, Mr. Sanjeev Gupta for delivering the vote of thanks. Uh, before proposing the vote of thanks, I just want to add two, two lines. Uh, this event uh, was conceived uh, to be, uh, we started uh, conceiving this event uh, in uh, June, uh, June 2023. Uh, it took six months to reach here. Uh, two, two to three times dates were postponed. We had a lot of persuasion with the IIT Delhi uh, for selection of the, this uh, uh, experts to be invited for this. I think in tunneling, uh, the most stalwarts, most stalwarts are here today. And uh, it was also proposed that we can have two sessions parallel, but it was decided uh, that we should conduct one session because uh, in uh, two sessions, people go here and there. I think practically no, no one is, mostly no one is available. So this was decided. Thank you very much. Uh, eminent speakers, eminent delegates, IIT Delhi faculty and students, as we conclude this tunneling symposium, I extend my heartfelt gratitude for your active participation in this enlightening symposium. The contributions in the symposium have enriched our understanding of tunneling, uh, tunnel technology, and your dedication to advancement in this field are highly appreciated. Let's carry forward the knowledge gained today to build more safer and innovative underground infrastructure in future. It was incredibly encouraging and motivating to see high level of attendance and involvement during the event. I think this, this is very encouraging uh, for everybody. <laughs> Firstly, I big thanks to Shri Krishnpal Gujarji, Honorable Minister of State the power of, for Power and Heavy Industries, for sparing his valuable time to grace the occasion and encouraging us. A special th thanks to Shri Nanlal Sharmaji, CMD SJVN, who conceived this idea, guided us throughout the complete process, and ensured the success of symposium. Heartfelt th uh, thanks to Mohammad Afjilji, Joint Secretary, MOP, Government of India, for being here. A big thanks to Shri Ramannaji, Shri Ayotya Ramanji, and their dedicated IIT Delhi team who worked tirelessly throughout right from ensuring availability of such renowned speakers as well as ensuring other logistics. A special thanks also to the caterers of this event. I also want uh, uh, to express my gratitude to SJV Knights also, who helped organizing the symposium. They worked so hard to make it success. Thank you all for in invaluable presence and engagement. 
safe travel, and we look forward for future collaborations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanjeevji, for delivering the vote of thanks. So with this, we close the two-day event, and I think it is not an end. It is a beginning, as it has been said. There is a scope for, I know, starting an institute for tunneling. And I'm sure, as Dr. Mr. Sanjeev said, you know, I mean, sorry, Mr. Sushil said, every year such event should be there in such a trust area. And uh, looking forward to having you all seeing in another occasion very soon. Thank you very much. Please join for a small tea outside, actually, just outside the seminar hall. Thank you very much.